Okay, I'm actually just gonna get started without her. Um, she's gonna come in a bit, but I'll be covering the first section. So, oh, well, today, wait, first of all, um, I hope you guys had an enjoyable spring break. Um, uh, so today we're gonna be talking about enterprise blockchain and specifically real world applications. Um, uh, companies are, I guess, pioneering or working with. Um, a little bit about the lecture overview. First, we'll talk about the motivations of enterprise blockchain. Um, next, we'll talk about use cases and in specific industries that are using blockchain in their everyday or in different things that they're doing and a few big names in the space. And then we'll start talking about uh, ICO schemas and culture. Uh, and finally, we'll end with laws and regulation. So, First of all, we'll talk about uh, motivations and perspectives. So when we talk about um, I guess motivations for blockchain. The main motivation is to, I guess, decentralize a lot of the existing systems that we have today. And so specifically for enterprise blockchains, the motivations for enterprise blockchains is that, I guess corporations started to notice that, start to notice that this blockchain kind of hype and uh, ICOs seemed pretty interesting. They, see, they saw like potential in the tech and they started being, they started to look at it and I guess try new things with it, but first, but before they could do that, um, they noticed that I guess existing solutions probably didn't fit their needs very well. Maybe they wanted a little bit more privacy. Maybe they wanted a little bit more uh, scalability. So they started to branch off and create their own like enterprise blockchain solutions versus using already existing frameworks or infrastructure. And that could be a problem. It might might not be. Uh, I'll dive in into that, but. In the space, there are a lot of like different perspectives about blockchains. You have, um, like, depending on who you're talking to, or specifically for enterprise blockchain, there's people who uh, are Bitcoin maximalists, which who think that Bitcoin is like the only cryptocurrency slash blockchain that would that is ever successful, or in the long term, every other altcoin blockchain solution or token will end up failing, and Bitcoin will be the one to like dominate the rest. Um, these people is these people have some merit in it because Bitcoin is very simple at its very core and it's supposed to do one thing and one thing only. There's very like little room for error. They think that a lot of the other existing solutions that are being tried out right now are a little bit too, I guess, ambitious and they might not be very successful. There's also people who think that just enterprise blockchains in general are worse off than just normal blockchain solutions because enterprise blockchain solutions are ta tailored for enterprises and corporations and in inherently they use like permission ledgers or private blockchains where um, it's a little bit more restricted in use than a normal blockchain like, like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Some people got into the cryptocurrency hype and they think cryptocurrencies are amazing. They think that digital assets are just a really interesting aspect to, to, to experiment with. And then there's also people who are very skeptical about cryptocurrencies, but they think that blockchains are pretty cool technologies to work with. So this is like mainly the perspective that um, I guess big banks had originally starting off. They didn't want to associate themselves with Bitcoin at the time when there was like the a lot of Mt. Gox scandal. They had the Silk Road scandal. So they wanted to touch upon the technology that uh, Bitcoin was using, but not be directly tied to Bitcoin. And then there's a lot of other people who are educated in this space that think that blockchains can be really cool, but then only in specific or particular ways. So there's like very limited uses to um, very limited uses to what blockchain blockchains or blockchain solutions provide. Um, so next we have like the misconceptions that you might think that you might get from an enterprise blockchain solution. So people, a lot of people think that enterprise enterprise blockchain solutions are always useful. So that's not always the case. Um, some use cases that enterprises are, are trying to use blockchain for have like fundamental flaws. So one thing um, specifically for supply chain use cases, the one fundamental flaw that use case falls into is um, the fact that it's very difficult to tie a real world or a physical object to a digital record on, on like the blockchain or even on a database. So that's very difficult to correlate that kind of connection. And so that's like the, the fundamental flaw that supply chain use cases have. And some 
use cases don't even need to use a blockchain. So some corporations have like, have like interesting ideas, but really they don't need the use of a blockchain. They don't need this um, decentralization. They can use some sort of like centralized database to do all their like record keeping or whatever. Um, and then next we have people think that blockchains are more efficient. So if we remember from, if you did watch the scalability lecture from last week or like last last week, there's a trade-off between this decentralization aspect and scalability. Um, so the reason why we're able to, uh, I guess, the reason why we're not, we're, we don't need to place trust in any of the members in like the Bitcoin network or the Ethereum network is because we distribute our trust um, or, and we decentralize everything so that we don't have to place trust in a particular entity or party in the network. And this way, we lose a lot of the efficiency that we have with normal transaction systems. But if you really wanted to have some sort of efficient or scalable network, um, you have to, I guess, decrease like your decentralization. You have to keep your trust of, I guess, centralized or focused on one or a few entities. And so if you see a blockchain solution or use case that's offering decentralization as long as, or along with um, like a really efficient and scalable solution, you might want to think twice about that because inherently you can't really have both. And we also have another misconception that blockchains are really cheap. Blockchains are really costly to maintain and develop to for even for the first time. And it's mainly a community effort for people who really believe in the tech and who want to see this technology grow. They do it, I guess, it's a lot of this, um, a lot of like blockchains are open source. And so people do this, I guess, free of charge. And they do this because of their interest or their uh, belief in the, the, the technology. And lastly, the misconception is if you're I guess, experimenting with um, enterprise blockchain solutions, you people just say, put everything on the blockchain or just build your own blockchain to do everything for you rather than use like, existing infrastructure. And this is not as simple as one might expect because a lot of the existing infrastructure that we have today, um, they've been proven to be quite successful and they have some sort of inherent security behind it. And they have a lot of like development technologies or strong developers behind these um, existing uh, frameworks. And if you were to build your own, you might not be as successful, you might not encapsulate all of that security that um, an existing infrastructure already has. So those are a few misconceptions about blockchain and blockchain enterprise. Um, any questions? Okay, I'm gonna move on to use cases and interests. So I'm gonna throw a lot of like information. You can probably find a lot of this online, but if you have any questions for me, um, just feel, feel free to ask me as we go. So, so first off, we have the auto and like mobility industry using or trying to use blockchain solutions to solve certain problems. So has anybody heard of Mercedes-Benz? A lot of people, right? So Daimler is the parent company for the Mercedes-Benz um, auto, like, like auto manufacturer. And so they joined the IBM and Linux like joint Hyperledger um, foundation back in like February of like last year. And what they're trying to do is they're exploring different like uh, blockchain use cases and specifically IoT use cases. So one thing that they've done is they, they issued a corporate bond over their own private blockchain just to experiment. Um, they've also worked with uh, this European payment company called Paycash uh, that is trying to do in-car payments or car-to-car -car payments. So this is pretty interesting because um, when we get to that point in time where uh, machine and machines can make payments to each other, that'd be really cool. Uh, they've also tried, uh, I guess, maintaining data integrity in-house and also data sharing with other auto companies because inherently blockchains provide some sort of integrity behind the stuff that you store on the blockchain. Um, and so when I call when I when I talk about data sharing, it naturally progresses to um, like vehicle data sharing. So everyone's heard of uh, like a lot of a, a really big topic in the well, auto industry has been self-driving cars or autonomous vehicles. And so 
the way that you have you allow um, vehicles to ever like drive by themselves besides having cameras and sensors on your cars is that you need some sort of driving data from your users or um, people who drive normally right so the idea here is that why don't you incentivize just normal people to drive normally and collect data from them and you reward them with a say like a token um, so everyone who drives like a car would be able to supply uh, driving data to these companies who are experimenting or improving their driving algorithms and people who share their data get rewarded uh, monetarily. So that's what Toyota has been doing. The Toyota Research Institute has been testing uh, like this decentralized data exchange um, with driving data using BigchainDB, which is like a decentralized database that's out there, that's um, currently out there. And also Jaguar and Land Rover are also doing something similar with this global marketplace of like shareable data or vehicle data specifically. And so a few like additional use cases for um, I guess the auto industry is naturally the supply chain use case. So when you're manufacturing cars, there are a lot of like moving parts or a lot of parts that get manufactured specifically for that car. And so a good use case is specifically for recalls, right? So Everyone has heard of, or everyone's probably seen like recalls on like faulty, uh, I guess, car parts or cars in general because um, I guess the brakes malfunction or something like that. So a nice use case for specific, spe specifically for uh, like recalls is once you have when you detect like a faulty um, like part or car part, you can see your origin of where those uh, like faulty car parts came from. And then you can direct directly find those, I guess, vehicles that might have been affected by this like faulty manufacture process. And so this is very useful in, I guess, for companies that I mean might need to like recall, or if you just want to get rid of like counterfeit parts in the market. And so another use case is machine to machine payments. So the idea here is let's say when we do get to the point in time where we have a lot of autonomous vehicles on the market and uh, let's say like an open spot open an open spot opens up in like a lane and there's two cars vying for this spot so one way that you can solve this if they're like autonomous vehicles is if one car offers to let's say offer a payment to the other car saying that if you let me this spot if you let me get um, if you let me move into this like open spot in this lane, I'll pay you some sort of uh, X amount, right? And that's one way that you can do like machine to machine payments. You can also do this for like parking, you can do for tolls, when you pass by a toll, it automatically pays the thing, pays the, like the toll structure or for you, or even with like electric vehicle charging stations. So um, you charge, if you're charging your electric vehicle, um, you pay for how much you, how much energy you use up and then you leave after you're fully charged. Uh, lastly, we have car sharing. So Slocket is like this company that per, like manufactures hardware for like this sharing kind of economy. And so one one thing that one use case or idea that's been brought up is like this decentralized ride sharing, like a decentralized Uber or Lyft. But uh, this I guess goes into a little bit of a gray area for these use cases because. Um, Uber, Lyft as like a centralized service, they offer basic, they offer some sort of like dispute management kind of process um, that involves some sort of human judgment. Do you, um, was your like Uber driver good or bad or something like that? Or even if your Airbnb, something like that was good or bad. Uh, if you decentralize everything, you don't have this central authority that's able to mitigate these types of disputes and you get into this gray area where this use case is a little bit iffy. So that's the use cases that we have for uh, the auto industry. Does anybody have any questions? So next we'll jump into big banks and financial institutions. So this is probably more, this is probably where more of the interest in blockchain has come from. So we've seen Ripple, Ripple when we talked about alternate consensus, it's like this protocol that allows banks to send monies overseas um, with, uh, with very, very low fees. And they use the consensus protocol um, 
federated Byzantine agreements to allow this types, these types of transactions to go through. And also, one thing that they also do is because they're kind of centralized by the Ripple company, um, they also allow for these types of like reversal of transactions, which is kind of um, kind of unexpected when it's coming from a blockchain kind of solution. But most blockchain solutions or transactions are finite and they can't be reversed. Uh, Ripple has something in their protocol that allows uh, you to reverse your payments. Um, if, but that's only for like the 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 real power comes in for the banks that are able to like um, reverse these types of transactions if they're like not not legitimate or something like that. And we also have like a direct competitor to Ripple called Swift, which is they're pioneering like this bank just messaging system for international payments. So very similar to what Ripple is doing. Um, they're a little bit different, but uh, and they have a lot of a few banks behind their back, but. Recently, they've come out and said that their, I guess, proof of concept uh, isn't like ready for mainstream use, so it's still not ready yet. Um, so, I guess there's just a competitor for Ripple. They're trying to do similar things. Um, it's just like a, a group of, I guess, it's a group of banks that want to settle international payments in like an efficient manner, something like that. Um, and we get to uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, so we've seen that their CEO, Jamie Dimon, condemns Bitcoin very publicly. But this is kind of ironic because um, like J.P. Morgan itself has been participating in a lot of like these uh, blockchain uh, involvements, such as the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, R3, and Hyperledger. And they're also developing like their own public private blockchain for financial use cases. Um, this is actually called Quorum. It's actually a clone of Ethereum, but they do, they do, they change it up a little bit. They ch use a different consensus protocol. They actually use Raft for this. Um, they also use uh, more, I guess, advanced cryptography or zero knowledge proofs to allow for, I guess, data to be, or certain transactions to be private to different parties. So normally, uh, if you're a bank, you don't want your client's uh, like account balances to be viewable by the public. So, um, or you don't want other people, other banks to just see which clients you have. So the way that uh, this, the I guess the vision for this public and private blockchain is to make it so that only if you are shared this data, you're allowed to see like the transactions between these different parties. Um, so that's the main idea behind Quorum. Uh, they to limit the I guess scope of what you can see in the like the blockchain, but you still want that like transparency and um, like accountability of like a blockchain. This is a pretty interesting use case. Um, next we have Goldman Sachs. So Goldman Sachs hasn't been really doing a lot, especially with uh, blockchain technologies. They've been exploring um, like the the technology and like investing their resources little by little because they do a little bit of research beforehand before they jump into this like type of environment or ecosystem. So stuff that they have is they offer like recommendations for cryptocurrency cryptocurrency investing. They also are looking into like wealth management or brokerage kinds of use cases for um, blockchain. Um, but mainly, they they're a little bit slow in terms of like the blockchain like arms race kind of thing. They ex they research their technology first before actually diving into it. Um, but they they might uh, invest more or into blockchain once like future opportunities really become more clear. Uh, right now, I think I think that like the blockchain ecosystem is a little bit experimental. So I guess when it becomes more finalized when it becomes more like clear that what companies are trying to do um, they might be willing to I guess put more money into or invest into like this blockchain kind of system any questions um, so next we have American Express uh, they're part of the hyperledger consortium um, they've been trying to do some sort of uh, use case where they're 
trying to use blockchain for data record keeping of like customer reward, reward programs and offer like cryptocurrencies as reward points. Uh, I find this kind of, um, or if you look at the like the idea that they're experimenting with, it seems kind of like lackluster because one of one uh, one caveat is that you don't normally hear people complaining about I guess customer rewards programs, so it's not really a big problem in the space. And two, you can simply see this being done in a centralized manner without having to use some sort of data or use some sort of blockchain to facilitate this kind of record keeping. If, um, if they just use a normal database, it would be much more efficient. It'd be, I guess, arguably a better solution than a blockchain solution, what a blockchain solution would provide. And so I think that, I mean, it's interesting that they're taking steps to, to adopt the blockchain technology, but personally, this use case is a little bit lackluster. Yeah. Just okay, uh, I'll actually get into that in uh, the next like the in the big name section. Um, but yeah, I will get into what Hyperledger is. And so these are other companies and other industries are I guess trying to use blockchain technology in their in their services. So naturally, we have the supply chain use case where blockchain is. A pretty interesting use case for, or is a pretty interesting solution for supply chain. Um, besides the, the caveat I, that I mentioned before, so Walmart is using Hyperledger to track their movements and origins of pork or food products. Um, so this uh, aims to alleviate like food safety problems. Alibaba, which is another big, uh, I guess, delivery or it's basically a bigger Amazon, but in China, but they're using supply ch supply chain. Um, a supply chain use case on the blockchain to reduce like counterfeiting of their goods that they're delivering. Um, they actually spent like two years developing an in-house private blockchain to like experiment with how that would work. Um, Maersk, the, uh, the a large, very large shipping company, is using Hyperledger to track like movement of their shipping cargo and freight tracking. Um, this is, I guess, a really cool um, way to. I guess because they have so much, uh, so much things that they're shipping around, that it becomes an interesting way to uh, track their movements of their ships. And also, Cisco, Cisco is testing um, like blockchain solutions for IoT devices. Uh, they can, can they can identify connected devices, modern activity, and evaluate trustworthiness of the device. So like some sort of reputation system. So that's what one thing that they're doing, and they're also part of the trusted IoT alliance, which is like a consortium of other other um, blockchain or different corporations that are experimenting with IoT. And so next we get into really big names in the space. So first of all, we have Hyperledger. So Hyperledger is led by, um, or the development of Hyperledger is led by the Linux Foundation and IBM. It consists of over 20 like different corporations, um, a lot of other participants and other institutions, but their main goal is to provide these enterprise blockchain solutions in an open source and collaborative environment. Their focus is primarily finance, uh, supply chain. That's why a lot of these um, manufacturing companies or shipment companies are using it for the like, supply chain kind of use case. And they also have focuses on healthcare. Um, so their main goal is enterprise focused software. So Hyperledger Fabric is one of their like private networks, or they allow for like plug and play solutions. What I mean by that is they allow for like really modular like consensus mechanisms to be switched in and out depending on your use case. Um, I think it's still in beta, beta phase, but it's uh, it's still like in development. These these technologies are still quite experimental, not ready for like mainstream use. But one thing I've seen from Hyperledger is like their demos or like their sawtooth lake demo, which is really interesting. So they use, um, I guess, a combination of different like IoT sensors, um, Intel SGXs, which is like their secure, um, like trusted uh, execution environments. Um, they use those two things to track shipment of uh, fish starting from the when they were caught all the way to the supermarket. And along the way, they would record like the GPS location of where like the shipment was. They would check um, t 
temperature at which this the, the fish was maintained at so that you know that it never went bad along the transport to the supermarket or to like the processing factory then to the supermarket so that's like an interesting demo or like case study that they've been exploring um, using Hyperledger's uh, software. And next we have, I guess everyone knows what a consensus is. It's a incubator for um, Ethereum focused applications. So it's mainly, they're, they're targeting um, Ethereum solutions specifically. Um, it's it was co-founded, or it was founded by Joseph Lubin in 2015, which who was also like a co-founder of Ethereum, and so they have this like hub and spoke model where Consensus is like this umbrella company where they have different spoke ventures branching off from their main like their main company. They have like Gnosis, which we talked about back when we had uh, prediction markets. Um, Virtue Poker is just like a decentralized like gambling platform specifically for poker. Uh, Ujo Music aims to, I guess, record uh, like record like IP or intellectual property onto the blockchain specifically for music. Um, MetaMask and Truffle are like the development tools that uh, are development tools that um, people use in the industry when they're developing like uh, Ethereum based applications and like Gitcoin is Another another spoke that has been uh, recently spun out where you can you can reward people for uh, you can reward people for I guess contributing to open source. If you have like open source issues on like say GitHub and you want people to work on them, you can attach like funding to them so people who complete like an issue or complete like uh, some like a task on um, your I guess open open source like library, you can reward them for that. Um, so they have a lot of things that they're doing, um, I guess, with... They have a lot of stuff that they're doing, and it's really interesting to see where they're headed. Um, next, we have R3, which is a banking consortium of a bunch of different members. Uh, currently, um, I think a lot of... I mean, recently, a lot of the banks have, I guess, left the R3 consortium, partly because of like a vision change. I think, um, I think the original like group behind starting R3 changed their um, like I guess mission on what they were trying to do with blockchain kinds of um, like research or like development, and so a lot of banks weren't happy with that, and so they left, and so they left, and they, I guess didn't want to associate with them any longer. They wanted to, I guess, they started looking at other alternatives for, I guess, a blockchain kind of consortium for banks. But when it was created, it was a bank, it, it was a consortium of a lot of banks who were focused on developing Corda, which is like a private distributed, distributed ledger to help banks record and manage and synchronize financial transactions. So that was the original intent, but then because they weren't getting anywhere with development or their mission change, a lot of banks ended up leaving and finding other other alternatives. And then we have the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, which is a lot of like Fortune 500 companies, startups, and academic institutions and governments. Um, the main goal for the Ethereum this the this Ethereum Alliance is to provide uh, resources for developing on Ethereum for these companies. So if they want to get involved in blockchain and they want to use Ethereum, this is like the way to go. They provide like roadmaps for features and deployment, and they also uh, have like these standards that um, these companies when they're developing on Ethereum what what kinds of, I guess, standards they need to maintain, what kinds of IP and licensing models they need to use for open source. Um, and it's just a lot of different companies that, I guess, are experimenting with the, the Ethereum blockchain, but not necessarily using it in their everyday practices. <laughs> and then we also have the United Nations who have, I guess, experimented with um, some sort of blockchain or cryptocurrency uh, Ideas. Uh, so the UN Food Program, they provided 
they issued food vouchers or 10,000 food vouchers to like Syrian refugees in Jordan. That was cryptocurrency based vouchers and they could be redeemed at participating markets. So this is really cool because um, this is kind of like a food stamp kind of idea, um, but rather than having like the, you don't need this like physical like food stamp to actually redeem your, uh, to redeem these, these vouchers, you can all, you, all you need is some sort of uh, identity associated with this. So basically like an address and once maybe that's scanned, then you have access to um, whatever the mark, this, whatever participating market offers you for these vouchers, which is pretty interesting actually. Um, UNICEF uh, has been looking at, uh, I guess, a custom currency via ICO, which is kind of a red flag for support, support programs. This is uh, kind of interesting because um, the fact that they're trying to create like a custom currency and ICO, but what they're doing is they're accepting like Ether donations and they're trying to target like use cases specifically for remittances and digital identity. And then next we have the International Monetary Fund. Um, what their use case that they're going for is these the cross-border payments, something like what Ripple is doing, something like Swift. But then the one thing that that kind of throws people off is that they, they're also exploring a central bank digital currencies, which is kind of defeats the purpose of like decentralized cryptocurrencies. Um, so I think that that part is a little bit, I mean, the part that they're looking into digital currencies for central banks is kind of um, off-putting, but I think Christine Lagarde is a fan of what uh, what this, what they're trying to do. Um, there's a lot of buzzwords being thrown around, massive disruptions, dollarization 2.0, uh, but you have to be skeptical about a lot of the stuff that's happening in this space. Um, we have the World Bank, which has a, their own blockchain lab, which they're trying to explore voting, uh, or they're trying to improve governance and social outcomes, which encapsulates like voting, land registries, fighting corruption, and they want to improve the transparency of like these, or improve transparencies or streamline procedures within their, like, within their, their different like branches. Um, the Gates Foundation has been exploring blockchain for the unbanked people. Um, so their Mojo Loop project is uh, mainly for people who don't have ready ac like ready, ready access to like banks, but they have access to let's say like a smartphone, and so this will allow them to um, send like mobile payment transfers, and it uses is built on top of like Ripple's Interledger protocol, and so it's very. It's not. I mean, it's really. Um, cool to see that uh, even like Bill and Melinda Gates are trying to do something with people who are who don't have the who don't have the who don't have like the access to banks like we do or who don't have access to like normal loans like we do, and so that's uh, one use case that the Gates Foundation is exploring. And lastly, we have um, other institutions in let's say the U.S. that are trying to mainly improve inefficiencies within their their many branches. So like the US State Department is trying to use blockchain to advance diplomacy and development objectives. Um, European Union um, and I guess the Department of Homeland Security is also do, trying to do something similar. Um, oh and lastly is this. Um, there's a bunch of like major consortiums or consortia that have emerged through the use of uh, blockchain technology. So there's like this trusted IoT alliance. Um, there's um, Spanish banks that are uh, trying to facilitate data sharing. Um, Decentralized Identity Foundation, which they're trying to promote standards and um, ways that you can like use blockchain identities um, as a way to, I guess, verify IDs, right? And I'm going to leave off on that. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask me now. No questions? Then I will pass it on, or you, we have a break and then I'll pass it on to Jill.
Sarah said no, and then next we were like, hmm, then what's happening with the live, the live stream? So we asked them like a bunch of questions or something like that, and then the deal was like, oh yeah, we're not live streaming this part. <laughs> that was that. So we didn't have to end up live streaming. Okay, that's good. It's near the end of the semester. I think it was. Actually, I never went to the the, the launchers back when you were giving like back where you. So I assumed that it was probably like this too. It's just we have a nicer. I don't. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, we have like. When did you say we were gonna start again? Why are you saying? Oh, just take take a small break. Just, just start whenever you want to. Okay. I was reading the, the slides this morning, and like, Max wrote so much underneath some of them. Like, it's just like, page, like, I kept scrolling. Oh, so man. much. Like, I don't know how you would get through all of it, so I just like... I technically did the, 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 not the ICO, but I did the laws and the <laughs> section on the DOC doc. And, yeah. But, personally, I don't know too much about that. Like the laws and regulations. That's okay. Because stuff has changed recently in like the past year. Yeah. So I'm true. like, well, I, I don't keep up with, first of all, I don't keep up that much with like latest news. And second of all, it's with laws and regulations, I, it's less probable that I can keep up with it. So I don't have like, uh, I don't know the, the latest about what, what, what things are concerned about like, uh, securities or not security. Okay, are we good to get started again? All right, so we're going to be talking about ICOs. How, who here knows what an ICO is? Or at least has heard of an ICO. Maybe it's why you got involved in blockchain. All right, so we're going to go over like ICOs, but also specifically over like why exactly. We've talked about ICOs before, but the difference now is we're going to go over the laws and regulations of surrounding ICOs or the lack thereof and also sort of the community that invests in ICOs and why, like, whose crazy idea this was and why it doesn't work anymore, like they intended. Okay, so initial coin offerings, we'll begin with the definition as always. Um, an initial coin offering is a novel, unregulated means of raising funds for a blockchain startup. So that usually consists of selling some amount of tokens to raise seed funding. Um, that token typically represents a unit of value in their network. And then some success with the technology generally should correspond to um, the tokens increasing in demand and then the value will rise. And the value of the tokens rising is, um, is a measure of the amount of faith that the community has put into that company's success. And so ICOs were originally an event um, like for a project to use cryptographic tokens was, as part of their token pool, um, was in order to exchange money with a community of developers and early adopters, people who really understood the technology, really believed in the technology, and those tokens were exchanged, um, they were referred to like as app coins or just coins. Um, and then this is where like 
the beginnings of this idea of an ICO came from. And now, of course, we know that ICOs are a popular term, um, and others now call it like a token crowd sale or a token sale or um, a token crowd fund, but all of it really just means this sort of model. And so, as we know, token values are often wildly volatile, precisely because their value is determined by the speculative market, where we it's determined by the amount of faith, which isn't necessarily a quantifiable thing. And that becomes problematic, um, as we'll see. Okay, so anybody have any questions about the definition? No? Okay, Pretty straightforward. So if we look into a little bit about the analysis behind like, the business model of an ICO, again, we want to emphasize that it's really great for people who really understand, like early adopters who understand the technology. Um, and it's perfectly suited for technologies where you have a really high need for capital. So, for example, um, so as we've mentioned in past lessons, a lot of blockchain protocols are self-funded protocol initiatives um, with high development costs, and they're traditionally funded through governments or large institutions who plan to benefit, but they've decided that um, they want to open source that. So until around, like, until this idea of ICOs came up, any open source project, would, such as the Linux Foundation, had to find their funding based on donations or services provided on top of that source code that was open source. Um, and they would provide the expertise and then they would charge some fee on top of that. And that was the only option. So the ICO model essentially created a new way of funding protocol infrastructure through this crowdfunding model. And you can understand that that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Like this basic idea was to have anyone around the world um, have access to this new technology, be able to support it because they believe in it. Um, and some leaders in the industry termed this as like bringing capitalism to the open source, where in the past only like some small exclusive amount of people have the opportunity to um, invest in the next Apple or Amazon, and now everyone can uh, contribute money and contribute support. And so one of the purposes for the usage of tokens was to align incentives between the development team and the early adopters and the developer community who want to participate. So as in Bitcoin, you see that those early adopters hold large sums of Bitcoin because they help develop the protocol, they help to maintain the protocol, um, and they encourage other people to participate. They try to encourage bug-free code security, um, and that's like a basic economic incentive. But if you go and read a lot of the blogs, a lot of the people just, like, they didn't do it for the Bitcoin because Bitcoin wasn't worth anything back then. The difference is now people sort of throw money at lots and lots of different ICOs and um, they just kind of like hold on to the tokens. And they're not actively invested, quote unquote, they're not like emotionally invested in um, the well-being of the company. It's more that they're there to make profit. Um, and that becomes problematic, right? Because uh, not all of the tokens actually create that incentive for a developer community to grow and create a successful project, which is really what they were intended for. So, um, in many cases, it's actually the opposite. And the core team now raises so much money uh, that they don't really have an incentive to work anymore. And so, the technology just kind of like sits there and people move on with their lives and some people lose money. So, does that make sense? Like, where this came from, where we're going, All right? Cool. So, talking about aligning incentives, uh, how it's usually done in terms of open source. Um, so since there wasn't really a clear path into monetizing an open source protocol uh, directly without making it proprietary with like intellectual property and patents and stuff, uh, most technological advancements stayed within like silos of small groups of people that had access to but didn't really want to reveal their findings and stuff like that, which was why perhaps technology had a hard time like being pushed forward. And so if we take, for example, like the Android open source project, um, imagine that there was like a token representing the underlying value of Android. Now consider that today, or in the last quarter of 2017, 86.1% um, of the smartphones sold ran on the Android operating system. So the value of that token really like blew up, right? Um, and that's sort of the same idea of it having represented some sort of uh, if you had bought in on that token early on, it would have been equivalent to supporting the Android open source project. Go for it. So, uh, could you remind us what would be the difference between a hypothetical token of Android and a stock in the company? Right. So, with this, um, we're saying that, like, if instead of, uh, so there's a difference between Android, the stock, and, like, 
investing in the company and supporting to the open source project. Does that make sense? And so in this way, you could support the open source project, um, buy tokens, support the community, and that's a little different from investing in the company, which, like, as we understand, an investment is generally um, made at the stage of the company where, like, in general, the public will invest in a company at the stage where this company is no longer in dire need of capital and stuff like that. Does that make sense? Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Yes. Proprietary. Proprietary? So it just means that somebody owns it. So the difference between proprietary, somebody owns it, and open source, where the technology is available to everybody. Okay. No more questions? We'll move on. So some ICO statistics. Perhaps everybody knows this subconsciously, but um, we can see that the ICO funding model is doing working pretty well for blockchain startups in 2017. Um, there has been more ICO money raised in US dollars equivalent than uh, VC money invested. And so we must realize that any USD value mentioned on media outlets in regards to ICO funding is basically a conversion from Bitcoin or Ether to USD, which means that if the tokens market cap falls from 100 billion to um, 50 billion, then it usually means that any amount in a, co a company has owned has halved as well. So that's something that maybe people don't know as much, but um, it's something to watch out for because it's valued in not US dollars. Um, yeah, and so that's true as long as the company didn't cash out to US dollars all the tokens that they raised. And if you think about it, if a, if a blockchain startup is like super invested in the space, they don't particularly have a reason to cash out all their tokens um, because they're part of the community and they're supporting, supposedly. So, um, But it's important to note that VC funding is still appealing for blockchain startups um, that are looking to go the safe route, that like want legitimacy in the space and they don't want to raise a substantial amount of money before having a working product because um, there are a lot of sketchy people out there who do that, um, but they still want funding to develop the product. So those who are looking to set themselves apart will sometimes go find a VC. Okay, questions about the large numbers on the charts? Cool, all right. So I'd like you guys to take a look at this next graph and talk about to a partner, uh, why the distribution is the way that it is. Can you guys see, like this large blue chunk is infrastructure, the red part is data storage, and the third part trading investing, then going down is payments, finance, gaming. Um, but just spend a little bit of time thinking about why it is that infrastructure perhaps is um, the largest use case for most blockchain startups right now. Can you guys see Okay, let's bring it back. Does anybody have any insights on why infrastructure <laughs> might be the easiest um, blockchain ICO like uh, topic? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah? Okay, well, the biggest use case is infrastructure, largely because not only do people interact with infrastructure in every day part of life, and like the technology is still new, and that I think is the bigger part, because um, when you go and talk to like people who are interested in um, using blockchain, like they've read about blockchain, they're like, aha, decentralization, or aha, verifiability, immutability, all of those, like, auditability, that sounds perfect for what I need, um, let me just use this. A phrase you'll hear a lot is like, let me put it on the blockchain, um, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, but um, 
often what that comes down to is like they find that, oh, well, I need some infrastructure that doesn't exist, so I now need to go hire somebody to build a blockchain, which can be expensive. Um, but that's a lot of why like we find people building infrastructure is because the infrastructure just doesn't exist for a lot of the blockchain apps to exist on top of. So that's part of why we find a lot of infrastructure in the early stages. Um, second being trading, any ideas? That's okay. Um, so the second larger is trading, in my own opinion, because we believe that yeah, go for it. Data storage. Okay, it's yeah. I can't read. It's data storage. Okay, so anybody have any ideas why it's data storage? Why exactly would blockchain be a good fit with data storage? Does that seem counterintuitive to people? Go for it. Yeah, okay. So regardless of whether or not you think supply chain is a good use case, it is something that a whole lot of people out there are interested in. And data storage is something that's sort of crucial for supply chain. It can be. Um, data storage is also a very profitable market. So you hear about like a lot of, like everybody has data that they need to be stored. Um, and so if you can find a better way to do that, if you can find an auditable way to do that, an immutable way to do that, um, that's also a very attractive, like, lucrative option. And so a lot of people are looking into that because, specifically because of the properties of the blockchain that are immutable and verifiable, um, all good things for data storage. So, and then the third being trading and investing. So the reason we might see that, any ideas? That's okay. Okay. Yeah, go for it. I was just going to say that the blockchain tokens essentially uh, carry all the same functionality as the like, NA currency. Okay, so he said that uh, blockchain tokens carry all the same functionality as any other currency. I'm not sure I would totally agree with the fact that they like hold all the same properties as any other currency, but tokenization and ICOs are generally like the first killer app that blockchain has really found. That's what blockchain right now is known for cryptocurrencies, right? You read the news and really what you hear about is cryptocurrencies. That's what blockchain means, oh, which is tragic, but um, it's the first killer app and that's what's brought all the media. So trading, trading is a big use case because trading is um, available 24-7 and it's still unregulated and allows people to do things that are not possible on the stock market. So people like that. Um, and yeah, okay. So many other industries you can see there are looking into the blockchain and seeing how they can benefit from it, but it's still largely dominated by infrastructure, data, uh, data storage, and trading and investing. Payments is and payments and finance, you might be surprised to see lower on that list. Um, but again, that goes back to what we talked about with scaling, right? Because um, a lot of the finance industry has hopped in, they got in early, they sort of like poked around with the technology, and then they found that they couldn't really find a way to get around perhaps the scaling, and so perhaps they just needed to sit back and wait a little bit longer for things like Lightning Network to develop. And perhaps we'll see a, an influx of that again in the coming years, but this is the state it's at right now. Any questions? Solid. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about legal uncertainty. How, who here knows what a security is versus an access token? Security versus access token. Okay, so we're going to learn a little bit about stocks and stuff today. I don't know. Um, so securities are essentially things that make people money. Um, so people expect it to be a financial investment. Um, there's something called the Howey test, which we'll talk about, but that's how it, essentially the SEC determines whether or not something is considered a security. Because if it's a security, then it falls under the Securities and Exchange Commission um, that the US government runs, and then they have like an obligation to regulate that. If it's an access token, which is for making money for early access to products and services, um, and the token stands for a unit of, like, uh, the token should, shouldn't should necessarily just be for people to make money, like people aren't speculating on it, for example, um, then that's a little different, and the SEC doesn't consider that as security, and so they don't do as much regulation on that. And so you can see how this very fine line is a little blurry when we get to blockchain. Um, it's easy to question the regulation behind it, and right now, there's not really any cut and clear regulations on this. It's still a very gray area, and a lot of different projects are either walking fine lines or experimenting with different models to avoid issuing tokens that will eventually be classified as unregulated securities. So we talked a little bit about the term for security being um, 
like a common financial investment vehicle. So like stocks, bonds, certificates of interest in a profit sharing agreement, those all fall underneath um, the Securities Act of 1990, uh, 1933. But um, again, when we think about tokens, um, well, our tokens in the digital space, in the digital ecosystem, sort of like in Ethereum, for example, we have Ether and Ether is used to buy gas, which allows participants to deploy their smart contracts and play the miners, uh, pay the miners fees um, in order to secure the integrity of our contracts. Um, but at the same time, Ether has been used for speculative purposes. And while most early adopters uh, purchased tokens back in 2014, um, they made like over 2,000 times on their initial investment because Ether was worth like not very much and now it's worth a lot. And that's how math works. Um, but I like that sort of thing where like Ether has two purposes where you could make a whole lot of money, but it also has inherent value and a purpose on in the Ethereum ecosystem. That's where like the fine line really lies. Like, what does the SEC do with that? They don't know either. Like, that's part of the reason why they haven't come forth with any like definite. Um, like, how do you handle that situation? Does anybody have any ideas? So I don't. Okay. Um, I think that's like why they haven't come out with this specific stance because they like that's the sort of thing that would keep the SEC commissioner up at night. Like, what do I do with this? It like it falls in between. So. Um, so this is why the legal space of uh, the legal aspect of the blockchain space can be very complicated to internalize and then also put into laws and regulations. And if this is something you're interested in, um, it's definitely something that like is needed. Like people, a lot of lawyers don't understand the blockchain space, and a lot of blockchain people don't understand how laws, etc., work. And so there are definitely there's definitely a need for people to bridge that gap. Um, but yeah, so just talk a little bit more about the how we test. So the first section um, addresses whether or not there's money invested in exchange of the new tokens. So most crowd sales that raise funds in Bitcoin or Ether will satisfy that security test. That's a major red flag, although it's not guaranteed to be a security um, because of other components. But so Bitcoin, for example, is not the only um, the, not the only way to earn new. Mining isn't the only way to earn new coins, but you can't create new Bitcoin by paying someone. Um, and so, while well, there's money invested in exchanging new tokens. Does this sort of make sense? Like, why, uh, why if I invest money uh, to get new tokens, this becomes problematic? Like, that's sort of a sign that this might be a security. You're putting physical money in? Okay. That's all I wanted to say. Second part is um, what actions those token holders must perform to receive economic benefit. So if it's just holding the tokens um, the same regardless of their participation, then you can look at that as sort of a dividend where like something will pay out um, and it will most likely be classified as a security. But if, on the other hand, um, a token holder's returns depend on their own efforts uh, and it can vary depending on the amount of effort they put in, then there's less likely to be considered a security. So it comes down to like tiny things like this, and it's very useful to have somebody who understands that as you're designing a token. Okay, and so um, just one more thing is that in July of 2017, the SEC released its first announcement um, regarding tokens regulations, and it addressed the DAO. Remember, we talked about the decentralized autonomous organization uh, case in 2016. So this was the case where a hacker managed to steal more than $100 million worth of Ether during the crowd sale. And the report mentioned the Howey test, and it was very clear uh, describing why the DAO falls under a security. And it stated that an investment contract is an investment of money in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profits to be derived from the entrepreneurial or managerial efforts of others. And so from that wording, you can sort of understand why they were able to make the argument that the DAO fell under the Howey test. Were there any questions about what exactly the Howey test constitutes or um, how, like, the difference between a security and an access token? Yeah, go for it. Sorry, what was the Silver Hills country club Oh, yeah. Um, I can make a Piazza post on this. I didn't want to get into it because it's like a long, complicated example. But essentially, it was... Um, actually, if you want to hear... Okay, so um, the Silver Hills country club uh, was this group of people who were looking for um, capital for 
to continue. They were running a country club and they were running for profit. Um, and they took that business model and they were trying to raise money, except it was a pretty risky venture and so they were looking for something called risk capital. Um, and because they needed like memberships to continue, um, continue whether or not they would, like when, whether or not the venture might be successful, um, there was an argument made that a club membership could be constituted as security, um, depending on like who was holding it and what they did with that like club membership and whether or not they sold it or something like that, um, which was a really complicated, convoluted, and also kind of non-intuitive case. Um, but I will make a Piazza post about it, and perhaps you can read more about it there. And I'm sorry. I think the country club like lost. They were considered security, which is strange. Um, but let me follow up on that. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, so the main takeaway here should again be the security and access token difference. Okay, so we're gonna go on. So an ICO, remember, started with this idea of as a way, um, it was a way for us to incentivize a community of developers to a common good. Um, some companies decided to take that with a different approach and instead of allowing the community to earn coins by participating in the network and contributing, um, the founders now end up doing things like selling large sums of their tokens in exchange for money. Um, and then they leave like some for themselves and they like trade on the side. They trade their own currency on the side to make money, um, which isn't really in line with why exactly we like first had this idea of crowdfunding. And so this allows like this sort of misalignment of incentives is, the, is part of the reason why like now we have ICO models where the startup is literally a piece of paper, like it's a white paper, and they're, they get over a hundred million dollars in the bank and there's no, really in, like, no real incentive to deliver on their promise. Um, and since there's no contract signed between the contributors to the ICO and the founding team, there's no obligation to return to investors and um, provide some sort of product and prove their honesty and integrity. So, so far from an investment and speculation standpoint, Investing early in an ICO in 2017, um, there were some people who made a fortune and got out early, and then some tokens like blew up and uh, grew like five times or 20 times in a matter of a month, um, from the time the ICO launched to the time it was available for trading on different exchanges. But by that time, often um, it's already too late, and that like that span is like what two months. So in the span of two months, um, you can make like five times, 20 times your investment, which is why so many people just kind of like go out and scatter money in a lot of different ones and they don't do their due diligence. And part of the reason this like whole model falls apart is um, while the original model is very dependent on this idea of early adopters understanding the technology, right? Um, we expect people to not throw money into things they don't understand. The problem being that now we have a whole bunch of people who are just looking to get in on the hype, and because that demographic is different, they're they're not doing their due diligence. They're just kind of they're people throwing money because they're they have a fear of missing out, um, and because they're suffering from FOMO, they sort of invest. And um, do you see why like this perhaps was not intent like that wasn't foreseen when we first came up with the ICO model. Um, it wasn't intended that people would just be um, putting money in and this would become a speculative game. Okay. Uh, so to, to talk about like how we solve those problems of misalignment between the investors and the teams, there are several ways uh, we could do this. One way that has been favorable is something called the escrow model. So. Founders don't get access to the funds unless they meet milestones on the roadmap, and if not, the money is returned to the initial investors. So one way to do that would be the multi-sig wallets that we talked about. Um, another way is raising like, smaller amounts of money based on milestones, just like a normal VC funding like roadmap goes. For every stage of development, you raise another sum of money to keep the operations going. Um, this allows the investors to reassess your work and is generally a, there's a reason why the VCs do it. Um, and so if you want more information on like trading and investments and tokens, uh, we have another free online course that describes the process and safety procedures of, that you should be aware of if you're interested in investing in ICOs. Um, but that is basically like all I want to talk about with aligning incentives. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, there's more. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we discussed the misalignment, but then um, the large sums of money become like 
it's, it becomes more of a marketing task than anything. Right? It, instead of judging based on how good the technology is, it becomes judging based on how good your marketing team is. Um, and there are some beautiful websites out there that don't really have a very good white paper. Um, and it's easy to be tricked if you don't understand the markets and who is standing behind each project. So this is something that actually happened. Um, anybody recognize who that actor is? I'm told it's Ryan Gosling. Okay, uh, that's I don't know. Maybe he like decided to change careers. It's a little unlikely. Um, but yeah, so pretty dumb things like that happen, and people are, like don't notice until some major news network perhaps picks up on it. Um, but again, like these are. These are just like things you need to watch out for. They're not all going to be as blatant as that, of course, but um, this is an actual ICO that raised quite a bit of money, so it's pretty tragic. Um, this is one coin, so this is one of the biggest scams in industry known so far, um, which was essentially a Ponzi scheme, a marketing pyramid, as known, um, and it's been banned in a lot of countries, and there's been an announcement by a lot of governments to be aware of things like this, so. Um, very inspirational. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the limitations of ICOs. So, as we know, um, raising money through a VC is very disciplined. Like, the VC isn't just going to give you the money. So, investors are doing their due diligence ahead of time. They don't invest money in teams that they aren't positive can deliver on the project. And for this reason, the VC has like a reasonable amount of risk involved and they can expect like a certain level of return on their investment. They have limited amount of resources that they can prov provide each team, um, but their VC will also provide more than just money, right? They'll provide guidance, they'll provide uh, venture support, um, mentors, etc., connections. And so one would think that having over 2,000 investors might be good because you have more people advocating for our project and helping market the project. And cast it in a positive light, because they all invested and so supposedly believe in the project. Um, but this can go the other way around. So if a team misses a deadline, or um, some team dynamics make some people uncomfortable, this company is suddenly um, perceived as like a scam, and it can be very difficult to get 2,000 people to trust you again, versus like just having to prove yourself to the venture capitalist board. So. Since more investors are truly investing for a speculative purpose, the token of the company will automatically get hurt regardless of the true story behind it. So even if your company is like honest and doing well, because of this like huge echo chamber, um, you can get hurt by just even like the smallest rumor getting out there. Which again comes down to the marketing team that you hire, which is not what this should be about. And so again, we see that there's sort of a misalignment of incentives and just like things going wrong that were definitely not intended to in the first place. And does everybody like understand the points here? What we're saying? Okay. All right. So to continue on some drawbacks, um, it's clear why raising money from a VC is a huge benefit to these startups. Um, you can have a large sum of investment, relative like a large large amount of money relative to the amount of time spent acquiring it. Um, but it does introduce a lot of risk to the people who are fundraising um, because if they don't have proper experience, they lose reputation, etc. But in the ICO model, there isn't necessarily an entity to answer to. Remember, like you might have the 2,000 investors, but no, no one of those 2,000 investors is actually technically holding you accountable. So if you wanted to run away with all the money, what's really stopping you? Um, most ICO investors, again, we, like we talked about, don't really know how to do proper due diligence. They don't really understand how to analyze the, um, the white paper, for instance, that you put out there. There have been instances where we find white papers that just have sections copied from the Bitcoin white paper. That's not really what you want to see in a white paper. Um, and so these are all things that like, we expect you guys to know because you guys have understood, like, you understand more about blockchain technology now, hopefully. And this is stuff that like, going forward you should be aware of and make your friends aware of as well, because it's quite dangerous. Um, like, yeah. So a lot of people invest with their emotions rather than logical business fundamentals, because you maybe really believe in the coin. You're the first person to have found this new like white paper. You really believe in it. You invest, and of course, then you don't want to hear that you're wrong. And so we find a lot of instances of people with with that sort of story as well. Um, so make sure you validate the white paper. Um, Read lots of white papers, it'll help you differentiate the good from the bad. Um, and if they're written by the team themselves, 
that's good. Um, sometimes they pay an external company to do that as well. Um, so there are companies out there that will write a white paper that will handle your ICO for you. Um, and this all comes because there was a market for it, right? There's people doing it, and people need more people to help them do it, and then there's more market for that. Um, and so really, there's like a whole world of problems that come with ICOs, um, and it's just important that you guys are aware of that, uh, because the ICO opens a whole bunch of opportunities to these people uh, because it brings a whole bunch of money and it's easy and quick and um, it's an attractive option. Okay, Did anybody have any questions about that? Okay, I feel like I've complained about ICOs for a while now. Um, so just one last thing is that the total market cap of tokens was relatively small up, up until around early 2017. In mid-2017 it hit like a huge spike and we have like $110 billion at the top. In August it got, oh, and then went up to like $160 billion at the top in August. And then it's fallen a bit because now we've seen that people sort of get burned a little bit. Um, there hasn't necessarily been a huge payout. We've heard about a lot of like schemes and um, a lot of like ICOs that have gone wrong that haven't delivered. And so people kind of get scared, scared to sell. Um, and don't make the money that they expected to, sort of have bad faith in the cryptocurrency and in blockchain in general. And this has just been sort of an all around uh, poorly handled media mess. But this is sort of the effect that we see on market capitalization of all tokens and cryptocurrencies. Any questions? Okay, so what do you think? The question was, does the price of Bitcoin affect the price of cryptocurrencies? Tokens. Okay, and do you think yes? Yeah. Why? Just the investors are all in based on the whole shit. And they'll just, as soon as like the entry is dropped, they'll all sell it. So that's the problem. Okay, so um, one way that might be linked is because some uh, cryptocurrencies that perhaps haven't done their research and don't understand that if you trade in Bitcoin and Ether, um, it can be considered security, right? That's one of the qualifications that we talk about. Um, so in that way, it could be linked if you're trading in and out of a currency with Bitcoin or Ether. You have more people putting in money into Bitcoin and Ether so that they can buy this other cryptocurrency they heard about or this other token that they heard about. Um, that's one way. Another way is uh, another way we could see that linked is the investor demographic. Right? We have we saw that a whole bunch of people got into trying to put money into Bitcoin and Ether um, when they started first started hearing about it, um, and then. We also see a similar spike in the number of people who try to invest in tokens. And so I bet you that there was some overlap in those people um, who sort of entered that market at around that time and were just trying to put money in because they wanted to get in on something they felt like was going to blow up. So in that respect, I think it's overlapped. OK. Any other questions before we get to move on? OK. So now we're going to talk about how we sort of handle that. Um, and all the laws and regulations that result. So, anybody for some reason know what a money transmitter license is? Okay, that's, that's totally normal. Um, the application process for a money transmitter license is known among industry professionals as a financial colonoscopy because they ask for so much information about you. Um, if you want to deal in money, you need to give a lot of information. And so, this is uh, what the New York Department of Financial Services requests from an aspiring money transmitter before authorizing the license. So you see they ask about a whole bunch of things. Some of them, like, maybe normal. They ask about third-party criminal and civil background checks. But third-party means that they check, like, a lot of people around you. Um, and then marital, divorce, and fam familial records. So they ask for just about everything. Um, but this is understandable, right? Because you don't want people uh, licensed to deal in money if you don't really trust them to not be money laundering, for instance. So this should make sense, and anybody have any questions about this? Okay, okay. so this is how we have anti-money laundering, AML. Um, so this is just the idea that we want to prevent undetected large flows of money from crossing borders or moving between the underground and legitimate economy. Problem being, Bitcoin does exactly that. Um, it was intended to do exactly that, and they're intended to be unregulated in a government-regulated world, which makes people nervous. And um, so, the laws that we're going to talk about is just 
kind of going over how they managed to meet in the middle. Uh, but does everyone understand sort of the motivations behind having AML? Should be pretty straightforward. Okay. So we have something called KYC, which is know your customer. Um, and so how many people here have Coinbase accounts? Solid. Okay. So often, depending on the amount of money that you are trying to trade, Coinbase, for instance, or Bitfinex, or just about any exchange, will ask you for increasing levels of identification. So first they might ask for your driver's license, then they might ask for a passport photo, um, then they might go up from there. And that's because they have KYC laws. So if you're trying to trade upwards of $10,000 per month, um, well, they need to know a little bit more about you. Are you a terrorist? Are you trying to transfer like drug money out of the like out of the US, this all becomes um, of concern because they're held accountable by whichever state they're operating out of. Does that make sense? Okay, um, and then another thing they do is evaluate the risk of clients, watch for anomalous behavior. That means that they'll watch your transactions and they'll study like tainted coins. We've talked about those, right? How like coins can be associated with certain addresses, and if they've traveled through a certain address, they're like a little bit sketchier. And if you've been dealing in a lot of those, they might that might raise some questions. Does that make sense? Okay, solid. Okay, um, so bit license is something that's specifically given out in New York, um, and those are the five things that you're allowed to do. And Coinbase has, um, I think, a bit license to operate in New York. Kraken is technically considered, um, they get out on like a bank technicality, so I don't think they technically have a bit license. I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, but the point is that it's regulated and they found ways to regulate it, but there are also always ways that people like find other ways to get Bitcoin. You don't necessarily have to go through um, an exchange. And so one way though, and it's notable to like remember this, one way that um, the government has found that is useful to regulate this sort of thing is they'll go through exchanges because that's the easiest sort of contact point they have with the blockchain. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Um, and then ETFs. Who here knows what an ETF is? It like deals in stocks a little bit. Okay. So an ETF, um, a marketable security that tracks an index, a commodity, bonds, or a basket of assets like an index fund. So essentially you buy just one thing, and that's, that one thing represents um, the success or decline of an entire bundle of commodities or bonds or like assets. Um, and you buy one thing so that you don't have to manage all of the uh, subsequent parts of that one thing you're buying. Um, and so it allows people to invest in items like stocks that perhaps you don't have access to or it's difficult to um, get into. Anyway, so the Winklevoss twins, um, everybody know who they are? Is Steve Mark Zuckerberg got pretty famous? Yeah. Went to Harvard. Okay, so the Winklevoss twins um, requested a launch a Bitcoin ETF, and they've been doing that since 2013, um, and it has been subsequently denied. And I have no idea how many times it's been denied, but it's been a lot of times. Um, and so this rejection is bad because um, the government keeps reaffirming that Bitcoin is beyond government control, um, which is exactly what gives it power, right? Because if you think about this, um, the U.S. government is essentially saying, no, we won't allow this to be traded on the U.S. Um, like we, we can't have this on the stock exchange. Like We don't have enough control over Bitcoin. It's not safe for American investors. Um, and there's a really fine line there to walk. Like, Do you give people the power to be stupid with their investments, or do you want to like make sure that they're safe enough and like, no, this is too stupid. Like We just can't invest in it. Um, and so that's sort of like the line that they're they're walking there. Does that make sense to everybody? Because regardless of like what they what their stance on the ETF is, that is sort of a statement on and like we have to understand how exactly that reflects on and that reflects on the community, but also what people in the community like sort of take that as. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay, because the government is reaffirming that Bitcoin is out of government control. Yes. Okay, so it's it's bad because it means it also means that like they're not willing to work with it. Does that sort of make sense? 
<laughs> yes, but in order to have like large market-wide adoption, like it would be good if like okay, so how would it change if now we had a Bitcoin ETF? You wouldn't necessarily just have to go and buy Bitcoin now. You could invest in a Bitcoin ETF. And like you I might imagine that a lot of people would like buy a Bitcoin ETF because the statement that comes from that is um, the US government has enough confidence in Bitcoin, for instance, to make it like available to all of the US public. And the difference with that is um, more that the, uh, the government is not partnering so much, but like they would be making some sort of statement that they like believe in Bitcoin and like somewhat endorsing it. Does that make sense? Okay. So it just points to like a poor relationship. Okay. Um, this is a very long quote. Uh, but this came from January 18th of this year, um, and this is from somebody at the SEC. And so, essentially, um, there were a whole bunch of ETFs, these ETFs that were proposed, and all of these requests were denied because um, because of these reasons. So they they quoted uh, extreme volatility, like they couldn't protect investors from extreme volatility, volatility, lack of liquidity, potential market manipulation. One thing they do like to quote is um, the involvement of Chinese miners, and so they'll constantly address this as like a reason why um, there's like currency manipulation. It's not safe for U.S. investors, things like that. Okay, um, and so one thing that I would like to note on this. Um, so all of these ETFs withdrew, but the Swedish Krona version of another ETF called like XBT Bitcoin Tracker One, um, they've been around for a while and they're traded on the Swedish exchange market. Um, and the difference is that like, and so somehow they've managed to figure it out. And the difference is that they trade um, an exchange traded product. So the XBT portfolios are exchange exchange traded notes, ETN, instead of exchange traded funds, ETFs. And so ETFs don't work there either, but ETNs do. Um, so that's potentially something to look into. Uh, but yes. All right. And so this, we're just going to end with some like, quick perspectives, and updates. And if you're interested, you can go and like read those links further. Um, but just to skim, uh, like there are bills passed in Arizona where a signature in the blockchain is also considered an electronic signature. Um, Vermont has approved blockchain data as representative of like facts and evidence, um, and like a digital record. It's an admissible to present a blockchain as a uh, digital record, which is quite interesting. Um, and then London is more welcoming to Bitcoin. Switzerland has something called Crypto Valley, uh, which is in Zug, Switzerland. Um, Japan, yeah. So these are all just like perspectives that we'd like you guys to be aware of. Um, and there's a lot more out there that we haven't touched on. So that's definitely something that you should try and keep up with. Um, and then again, yeah, just more perspectives. But you guys have been here a long time. I've been talking for a long time. I hope everybody has a good week. Um, thank you for listening. Cool. Yeah, what's up? Uh, we'll post some thoughts about the homework. Is it on here? No, no it's not yet. So readings and homework, we'll decide. We'll like publish later. <laughs>